Hi, everybody. We're ready for our next uh, session. Uh, we're going to have uh, Jeff Hyman up here, uh, who is, uh, comes to us from uh, Fresh Deck Poker. Um, a little bit about Jeff's background. Uh, he was the founder and creative director of COG1, which is an advertising agency. I think he was in the business for about 11 years or so. Yeah. And uh, won a bunch of Clio's, uh, the one sh the Cons Lion, the Addy, the Icon Award, Advertising Week, basically every single award you could win in the advertising business. I don't know why he left, but uh, obviously he probably did the right thing. Um, and entered the um, game world with really like an amazing design. If you've played any of their games, the Idol games, Idol Worship, uh, just had an amazing response in terms of their design uh, and ingenuity in terms of the kind of you know, gameplay that it offered. Um, but then the company moved into uh, Fresh Tech Poker. Uh, the game is up and running. Uh, today has about 135,000 DAUs. So it was a very successful game. Um, and so Jeff has now, uh, you know, he was the uh, CEO and uh, founder of Idol and has now moved to being an uh, entrepreneur in re residence uh, for Signia Ventures. Uh, so, uh, and he's going to talk to you today about the story of making uh, Fresh Deck and uh, what he learned from it. Great. Thank you so much, George. So, thank you for the introduction again. I want to take you through an actual empir empirical and quantitative sort of uh, post-mortem on what we did on Fresh Deck Poker with innovation because innovation the lack of it and too much of it is something that I know all too well, which I think that we really need to begin with an ultra quick sort of summary of innovation in the gaming industry that this here is table tennis created by Ralph Baer at from Magnavox 30 minutes away from here in Burlingame Ralph and Magnavox demoed table tennis to the world and in attendance was a young Nolan Bushnell that you may know that founded and started Atari. And that's Atari's Pong that was released immediately after Table Tennis was released. And it hasn't changed really since then in the innovation. If we look at Tiny Wings, they took the core mechanic of WaveSpark and they polished it. The same things with Angry Birds, which was really Crush the Castle. And they basically took the whole game. I mean, they re replaced a trebuchet with a slingshot. They replaced birds with uh, stones, or I mean, stones with birds. They replaced knights with pigs, and probably the designers replaced, you know, drinking mead with mushroom tea. So, what you really have is a history of, let's see, being inspired or flat out taking other ideas and greatly polishing them improving upon them, simplifying them. So based on the case study of Angry Birds and Tiny Wings, what, you, what can you really learn? And probably the most important thing you can learn is just put a fucking bird into your game because you're going to have a massive amount of money, you'll get a TV show, and everything's going to be fantastic. But is changing art, setting, production values, innovation, and is being inspired or flat out stealing other games or, or polishing a game mechanic and making it more interesting, simpler, different, is that actually innovation? And what I've come to in my sort of appreciation and understanding is who the fuck cares? Because what happens is that small incremental steps is the form of innovation that works best in the game industry. Fresh Tech was very great. Uh, we, we were really happy that we were announced for two uh, Operator Innovation Awards from EGR, one of which we won. And that's fantastic, and that's great. And what I want to do is say, what I've learned is don't go through all of that. If I removed my shirt, it would be covered in scars and bleeding that you would say, is that choose to innovate on no more than one to two vectors at a time. That's it. And choosing what to innovate in a casino game can be incredibly challenging because sometimes you're dealing with century-old game mechanics. You know, you can't have another two cards dealt before the flop, and let's call it a flip. You know, people, it's not going to happen. This is entertainment. People will spend precious few minutes learning a new mechanic. They want to be entertained. Although this might be lean forward, it is very much lean back. If you don't do any innovation, you're at the risk of creating shovelware. And let me assure you that if you do too much innovation, the shovel's going to be in your hand as you're digging your own grave. So I want to give you a quantitative look at the qualitative decisions that we did in Fresh Deck Poker. So this was poker when we found it. Everything looked identical. It was mind-bogglingly well-entrenched incumbents that had years of lead time, 
and every single one of them looked identical in appearance. This is what our game looks like and what we tried was first to be differentiated by a first person view. I was convinced that we could not have another fly on the wall view of a poker game because everybody was falling on themselves to copy that and I said we have to do it this way. It's more evocative, it more creates the vibe that I'm actually playing poker with my friends. The other thing we did is also add in this sort of comic book style chat so that you weren't looking at a little box down on the bottom right so you could have the chat there. And we also greatly simplified and polished the UI. But everyone, investors, general managers, everyone was freaking the fuck out about this because, oh, it's scary, it's innovation. So what we did is we also put and created the stereotypical top-down view, which is really lesson number one, which is if you're gonna take a risk, and you should, take the right risk, have plan B. Just have it ready to go. So we hedged our bets with that top down. So as I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna say this is what we did and how that all work for you, Jeff? Well, this is how it worked out for us. People love the art. It totally succeeded in differentiating the product. The monetizing benefits of people buying and customizing and leveling up avatars, nah, it's whatever. People buy it, but it's not gonna make us money. We did do A-B testing and multivariate testing on everything, this being one of them, and this is where I finally got my vindication, is that we had 16% more hands played when people were funneled into the first person view as opposed to the top down, and a 3% increase in revenue. And I don't know about how many of you guys have casino games out there, but I'll take 3%, if anything can get me a 3% uh, increase in revenue, I'll take it every day of the week. The other thing that we tried to do is create quality and quantity of richness of animations here. I want to celebrate the win, I want to create excitement, and I want to make it not look like crap. So desperately, you know, in advertising, you don't win awards by copying ideas, and you don't win awards by making stuff look like crap. And what we really wanted to do was make something special, so we filled it with richness and awesome animations. It looked beautiful, it received positive feedback, but I am absolutely fundamentally convinced that the average Facebook user has a Commodore Amiga. And let me tell you why. 25% of the Facebook users that we were mining data had a frames per second of less than 15, which makes any game unplayable. 10%, a full 10% of users had less than seven frames per second, which is just, I mean, they're basically connecting from like, the darkest of the Congo here. Which made us question load times here. And so we took it load times and we were like, okay, let's do all of this work to reduce load times by 40%. And it had no discernible effect whatsoever in retention, revenue, whatever. But what we did notice is when we delve a little bit deeper is that outside of America, it actually increased day one retention by 21%, which makes me say, who cares? They're non-monetizing countries that this made a difference to. And if I could do it all over again, all of this massively gorgeous art that we had that we stripped out, I would have left in because the people that are spending the money cared about it. We also made a massive effort to make the game have true cross-platform and platform portability. You can play our game, close your laptop, pick up the same exact hand, and go to Android, go to Kindle, go to your iPhone, go to Facebook, go to whatever, and you can have ha seamless, same hand continuation, which was a huge effort, but we also wanted to have that single pool of player liquidity. How did that work out for us? Well, the interesting bit is that it was absolutely shocking results at cross-platform. One, cross-platform retention for day one increased by 239%. Day seven was 387%. Day 30 was 650% increase. Conversion of these players is 591% better than just a player that plays Facebook or mobile device on its own. There's a great question here of causality. You know, are these people just better players as is? Or is it because that they installed the game? We started to look at that and the data does support that once we would get a person that was only playing on one platform to go to the next platform, they would all of a sudden start to show signs of this behavior. Another thing that we try to do is focus on ratings and be, take the high road and be noble and we wanted to do less spam. And well, one of the things here is we got rated 4.7 stars on Facebook, uh, I mean on Google Play, four and a half stars on uh, App Store. And for some reason on Facebook, we, we could not get past like 3.9, 4.0 stars. And we had no idea why. So we started doing all of this work because we wanted to be the highest rated game anywhere. 
So we started to remove all the spam from the game. And I, I'm being tongue in cheek on saying spam. And I'm being outrageous just to try to be fun and make you not be so tired. But if your retention is too high and you're making too much money, by all means, take the high road and stop spamming because it is going to fucking cripple you, as is evidence here. If you're familiar with Facebook's app to user notifications, fantastic tool. We use them all of the time. We use open graph integration all the time. There is when we turned off all of the app to user notifications. And then that is at the point where the board was saying, OK, you can turn them back on, right? 21%, almost 22% decrease in day one, 17% decrease in day seven. And this was for Facebook as well as for mobile users. The other thing is advertising your game and marketing the game effectively. If you are not doing effective and continual in-game promotions and advertising for your game, you are losing a massive amount of money. Now, finding the right cadence, finding the right tempo, and figuring out the right balance, well, good luck. I hope you have a great A-B testing system because you're going to spend weeks, if not months, doing this. But when we found our sweet spot, it's a 42 0.86% increase in conversion, 33.65% increase in revenue at the cost of less than half a percentage on day one retention. And this was versus the right number versus no ads whatsoever in the game. You are leaving money on the table. This is the outrageous part. Some of it was also outrageous, but this is the more outrageous part of the talk which is we have always made a huge deal about that. We're real, we have a random number generator that's certified. We got certified by the GLI group, the TST group. We offer authenticity of gameplay. So why did we choose that to do that? Well, 35% of the complaints that are in the iTunes and Apple stores is that our game is rigged. And I can tell you with 100% certainty, our game, can't speak of anybody else, is 100% not rigged. It is Real random, OK? So we wanted to address that. Is poker without a random number generator still poker? I don't know. I don't think it is. But I do believe you have to have this if you want to be able to migrate customers to real money gaming. And I am a full on believer that customers will convert. We have people spending $15,000 on chips that they can never cash out. You cannot tell me that that person won't play real money poker when it's legal in California and everything else. So I do think that they will convert. However, if you don't have a random number generator, it's not going to feel like the same game. It's not going to behave the same game. Therefore, your customers aren't going to retain. Therefore, your customers aren't going to monetize. At best, they're going to try and churn. And at worst, they're going to get fleeced because they erroneously think that they have skills and luck and experience in a game that follows a vastly different point of view. Now here's sort of my challenging statement, which is, are the rules for poker and other regulated casino games antithetical to the best practices of free-to-play games? 63% of our players lose their first three hands playing the game. 63% of people lose all three times that they just come to the game. What modern free-to-play mobile or social game would actually let that happen? New user flows are designed to prevent that. We lavish our users with praise and yay, achievement and victory. Imagine the scenario. It's like, welcome to Candy Crush Saga, level 300. Fuck you, you lose, play again. It's just not going to happen. Rather, this is what you see for about the first 15 levels. And guess what? You have to have serious damage to your frontal lobes to not make it past the first 15 screens here on, on Candy Crush Saga. Would Candy Crush and, um, and you know, Angry Birds be that good if 63% of them were failing at the first three levels? One of uh, a great case study is I was chatting last night to a person that told me too much information because they uh, had too much to drink, but I'm like, I'm using this just to let you know, is that their scratchers at goldenpalace.com, they had scratchers, they changed it so it wasn't an RNG, it wasn't a random number generator so that you won the first scratcher, increased sales of tickets 400%. So why not have a random number generator? Well, the game is rigged. I've learned 
that you can go up and down, get every certification in the block, shout it from the rooftops, tattoo it on your chest, and you are still gonna get the same amount of people complaining. You can have increased retention, you can have increased revenue, and why and how? Well, in theory, alter the logic of the deals. If I do nothing more than give people better whole cards or starting cards, they're gonna actually increase the action. They're gonna fold less. And if they're folding less, they're playing more. And if they're playing more, they're gonna increase the amount and the number of their bets. That is going to increase bust outs. And let, make no mistakes for those of you that are in poker, getting into poker, or in casino games, busting out is the only thing that monetizes in free-to-play poker. So you, it's antithetical to how real poker is. Real poker, you want rake, you want to have people in there, you don't want them to bust out. This is how it works here. I want to say this is the most awesome data. This is the last thing that I did before I stepped into my EIR role was doing a massive analysis of new players with their strong, that had strong, quote unquote, first hands. 100% increase in conversion. 113% increase in the number of hands played, 53% increase in net revenue, 66% increase in retention. The fascinating thing here is that we can fall over ourselves and say we're stacking the deck, we're cheating, we're tricking the, the player, and you probably are. And I don't know, I'm not gonna, it's a longer session to talk about if that's right or wrong. But what I can tell you is by having 66% increase retention, the users are actually having more fun in this. So I don't actually subscribe to the belief that you should be stacking the deck because I think it's a short-term strategy. If you want to have a partnership with a real money casino, they're never going to let you do it. But I don't know of a casino like slot game out there that doesn't have like its first 10, 15, 20 spins actually you know, not sort of rigged so that it's a scripted occurrence. So I do think it's an interesting strategy to evaluate and those that don't have aspirations to get into real money gaming and don't have aspirations of getting into a casino partner, this might be an innovation that you want to think about doing while you still can, because right now, there's, it's the wild west out there before regulation comes. So that's it, there's five minutes left, so I wanted to open up to any questions that you had. If not, I'm gonna have a drink. <laughs> Anything else? Great. George, all you.